So I'm unmuted now? Yep, and we are recording. <laughs> All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Monday, as Charlotte said. Thanks for joining in. And um, today we're going to, the next three weeks, starting today, or the, yeah, yeah, three weeks, we're going to be doing the different parts of the Clayhead Trail System. And I sometimes have trouble knowing how to name them. So if you thought you were doing a little bit further south than where we are today, sorry about that. We're sort of doing what I would call the midsection westerly. And um, I am going to get started. I've got an extra map in here today that shows the Clayhead Trail System area. So everything outlined in white is uh, the Clayhead Trail areas. Um, now don't use these for wayfinding because <laughs> they're pretty rough. You know, I might have missed a corner here or there. So, but generally, everything outlined in white is the is the main part of the Clayhead trails. And some people do still call it the maze. I I don't. I I refer to it as the Clayhead trails. Um, and we're going to be doing this section here. So um, this is what I'm calling the middle section and the west part of the middle section. And next week we'll do more of the east part of the middle section and and then the third week we'll be doing the north section uh, the south section whoops sorry the south section um is well we cover some of it but it's pretty much mostly uh the the established clayhead trail that you're might be familiar with by going to the clayhead trail and parking and going so um we just to get your bearings a little bit in the big map, we're going to be entering at what is called the Long Lot Trail entry of the Clayhead system. And it's just down the road from the Hodge Preserve, which is right here, which makes for some very good parking. And then you just walk down the road and there's an opening in the stone wall that takes you in here. Uh, the other way that many people go to the Clayhead Trail is to go this road, which is the Clayhead Trail Road, right across. The entry is right across from the transfer station. You go down this way, you go off, and this is the parking area, and then the trail goes off like this. So just sort of give you a rough idea of where we are on Block Island. So today's um, loop is a loop trail uh, with two ends. So you could actually loop it from two sp starting spots. Today we're gonna start here at the, at the long lot entry. And we're gonna go this way, it's a very, it's a, uh, a long lot. <laughs> so it's called the long lot. And this pond is called long lot pond. And then we're gonna go through this area. We're gonna come out here and we're just gonna take a little spur right here so I can show you what the entry looks like if you were to come from the road that goes to Lapham's. And then the, uh, you would enter that by coming down the Clayhead Trail Road and going and parking at the parking area for the Clayhead Trail and then just walk back here for this entry. And then, oops, darn. Um, and I then we'll go back this way and then loop back and uh, finish off. The green lines indicate uh, connecting trails um, of which, if you're familiar with the Clayhead Trail system, you know there are a lot of connecting trails. I'm hoping that, um, some people are fearful of going into the Clayhead Trail system on the interior part, not just covering the bluff. So I'm hoping that these three together will give you some confidence that uh, you will not be lost forever if you go into the inner part of the Clayhead Trail and you'll find and see things quite different than what you would see along the bluff edge. So we'll get started. This is the entry point off of uh, Corneck Road, just down from the Hodge Preserve. And uh, there's, it's on, if you're going north towards Sockham Pond, it's on your right-hand side of the road and there's a little bank and you go down the bank it's, and there it is, the open stone wall is pretty open and you'll see it right away. It's, it's well signed um, and it's got this sign right here that says long lot that connects to Clayhead Trail. <laughs> They're all clayhead trails. I generally refer to what they're talking about when we say clayhead trails, and you all speak about it a little bit. There is one trail that takes you to the bluff, 
and it's blazed with uh, yellow um, blaze markers so that people can stay on that trail and feel confident that they're going to get to the bluff and back. But uh, we'll be going off of that and you'll see that as we go. So the first part of the trail is um, kind of straight. It's typical Block Island vegetation right now, but things are changing. If you were with us at the beginning of the summer, you would have seen a picture of the pasture rose or the Carolina rose, a beautiful pink flower. Well, uh, roses produce, the name of the fruit that roses produce are hips. And uh, this is a pasture rose uh, hips and uh, very high in vitamin C. Uh, you can tell it's a pasture rose, one, because it's in the pasture, uh, that's, but also mostly because of the leaf structure. Very small, more dainty, um, nothing like the beach roses that you see. But these are quite robust hips for, uh, for the pasture rose, um, and that is a native plant. And along this very same, uh, all of these trails have a good mix of native plants, naturalized plants, and invasive plants. And uh, until last year, I had not seen mile a minute vine uh, on the corn neck, on the neck area of the island, but here it is climbing up this tree quite a bit. And this is all new growth. Um, and they're well known by mile a minute for its um, triangular shaped leaves. Um, and I didn't see any berries yet, which is good. Uh, we don't like them to set berries. I, I, a uh, mile a minute vine berry can last up to seven years in the soil and be viable. So anytime you can rid the plant, get rid of the plant before the berry set is a good thing. And you'll see again that these uh, leaves are riddled with little holes and that's a good sign. That means that the, uh, the, the beetle, I mean, excuse me, weevil, there's a weevil that eats only mile a minute vine. And it seems to be, I'm finding in the mile a minute all over the island, having evidence that the weevil is working on it. So I'm not sure we'll get rid of mile a minute uh, due to the actions of the weevil, but maybe it'll be a little bit controlled. So, so there's our mile a minute. And uh, so the first part of the path goes along. You see also the sort of the through line this summer has been blackberries. Um, we're starting to see blackberries. Uh, we, lots of lots of red ones and for the most part on this trail the blackberries that I saw are of the species that are a little smaller they're still blackberries they're not dewberries trailing on the ground but they're a smaller uh, variety they're not those big you know inch and a quarter luscious um, blackberries but something I haven't seen very often maybe just haven't looked closely enough but these berries are actually half and half this one this one, this one, some of the little individual pieces of fruit are red and some are black. And, uh, and here you can see, so this is a great view to see how the sort of the progression of how the berries go from green to green and red, reddish, more to red, red to black, almost all black. So it's coming, those blackberries are coming. Um, as you go along, uh, you come up pat the first part of the path, maybe a hundred feet or so is, is a nice wide open path that has the things I, I just pointed out. And then it opens out into technically what is long lot. And it's a long, narrow lot. It's got, um, uh, the path as you see it, it right here goes along the side and down the middle of it is a spine. I call it a spine of uh, walnut trees, black walnut trees. And there's several of them right down the middle of it. Um, really beautiful, shady. Uh, they produce fruit. Um, there's one that broke off uh, this early winter that hasn't been removed yet, but so far there, they are um, doing quite well. Um, oops, wrong way, so sorry. I wanted to go backwards just for the fun of it. Now I'm going forwards. There we go. Uh, the spine of walnuts, and there's the walnuts hanging up in the tree. Um, the leaves of the walnut tree are these big long fronds. This is this is one leaf, and these are little leaflets that come off of the spine. So that's an interesting form that you see a lot. And the husks, these will stay on there oh, into late fall, and then eventually they'll drop. 
I have collected uh, several of these over the years, and by the time I figured out how to open one, and this goes, the, the Lapham family who planted these um, will collect them when they're here in October. They're still not quite ready, but at least they're on the ground where you can reach them. And uh, they have tried to open them with a brick and a hammer and been unsuccessful. <laughs> so walnuts are tough stuff. So I've never known them to actually produce a nut that was edible, but doesn't mean I won't keep trying. It's a good spot for uh, black walnuts. It's also a good spot along this way for milkweed and the milkweed tussock moth caterpillar. I've been getting uh, a fair moment of calls every year I get about what is that furry orange and black and white caterpillar that is eating the milkweed. Well, it's a milkweed tussock moth caterpillar and they are voracious. Uh, this one you can see is really, it's, it's actually even working on the milkweed pod. Uh, here it is over there a little farther out. It's eaten the pod. This was a leaf. It's eaten all of the leaf, including its little connecting pieces up to the spine. This whole plant is basically nothing left of the, of the uh, vegetation except for the pods, and it's working on the pods. So sometimes you'll see great masses of these tussock moths, uh, caterpillars, on the milkweed plant. And, uh, you know, I don't think they're, we've still got plenty of milkweed. They're not decimating the milkweed population on Black Island, but they can do a number on uh, milkweeds in a specific area. Um, so uh, there are plenty of milkweed in this field, but the ones nearby this guy uh, were pretty well eaten down. But it, it will produce a moth and birds will eat the moth. So got to feed those birds. So we keep going down. We're still in long lot. Um, I, I mentioned the spine right down the middle of several uh, walnuts planted, but down near this end, there are some of these large or tamaracks. And the path has gone right down the side of the, the field or the lot, and it's gonna curve off to the left. Um, but here's that yellow blaze marker. So we're still on the main trail that would go to the bluff. So. We're gonna go and we went around the corner and it's giant maple right here. And um, on this particular walk, we're gonna see a lot of giant swamp maples. Um, they're really quite beautiful and their form is very distinctive, sort of this big, low spreading, big leaves. And if you look right here, right there, there's another blaze. So you know you're going in the right direction to hit the bluffs. Oops. So not too far after you go up around the tree and up the hill, you'll come to your first cross, uh, sort of fork in the road, as you, if you will. And uh, again, there's the blaze. And if you go left, you'll see another blaze on a tree, you know, not too far. So you know right away you're still on the right path. But this is where we're going to diverge and we're going to go right. And when we go right, we're going to immediately look down a path that goes downhill and it's going towards um, Long Lot Pond. When you get down to the bottom of the hill, you can walk through the brush and get to the pond or you could go left or right. In this case, on this first one, I went right just a little bit so that you could get to the very edge of the pond. This is the west edge of the pond, but the path dead ends at this point. Uh, this time of year, it's about the only time you can, it's about, it's one of two places where you can actually see the water. There's so much vegetation right now that uh, the vision, uh, you know, what you can see is um, really obscured. And I will say that this particular walk does not have any of those grand views that I have shown in some of my other walks. Everything is very close in, which Sometimes it's like, oh, you know, I, well, I want to see the openness, but other times it's like it makes you focus in and see what what little things might be hanging around. So if you were here, you would then turn around, go back to where the path met the pond, and then you would go along this edge, and this edge goes right along the pond, uh, but you can't, this time of year, you can't see very well through this brush. You can sort of look through and see little glints of water, but for the most part, you can't. This is a great path in, um, in the winter time. It, everything opens up. 
you can see lots of birds in the pond. Uh, and because there's a lot of sort of dead and dying trees in here, especially old pines, it's a great place for fungus, uh, fungi. So if you happen to be into that, then uh, that would be a good walk and you wouldn't have to go too far. So when you get to the end of the path that goes along the water, it kind of opens out into a little sort of intersection right here. So, and there's a little stone wall and that's long since gone stone wall, but they come, a little rise right here. Watch your step and then step into the opening, which is here. And again, you'll have to make a choice whether or not you more or less go straight up this path or if you go right. In this case, we're going right because we're sticking to the west edge of uh, the Clayhead Pass. We will be coming back later this way. So this area on the map is, is notated as seven. So just um, this is one of the walks that if you had the map, it would probably help you. Um, the map that I draw with the numbers uh, help you stay in the direction you want. But basically, you just once you get past the big pine and you get to your first point of divergent, just go right. So once you go right, you go you start going down the path on the other side, on the south side of Long Lot Pond. And again, it's rather straight because Long Lot Pond is kind of oval. So it's got the long, the long southwest sides are are um a relatively straight, well-maintained path. And when you get to the point here where the path is about to turn to the south, you will see that it could also turn to the north and get a view into the pond. This is the most open view of this pond at this time of year. Uh, and it's quite lush. Uh, most of this walk, uh, a little further, we're going to be seeing plants that thrive on moist moisture. And uh, even though it's been extremely dry summer, you'll see that uh, things are are doing fairly well if you're a moist loving plant in this area. Uh, it's up close sort of of looking across the pond. There's lots of these uh, pond lilies, not beacon with the white water lilies. Uh, these are pond lilies and these are pretty much as far open as they get. They stay sort of clenched up like a little fist. They might open a little bit, but but not much. And they have those giant, very heart-shaped um, water lily pads or pond lily pads. Um, and hanging up over here, you can see this purple. Let's see, maybe I can even, yeah. If I, it's a little out of focus, but um, this is, um, known as water willow or swamp loosestrife. And this is not the loosestrife that is uh, a problem. This is a native plant and it's just starting to, to bloom. This whole stem will actually um, become quite purpley magenta uh, at, in, within the next week or so. But they're always around uh, very swampy, wet, they like their feet wet. It's not in the water, but it's at the water's edge. So, and of course those pond lilies can be quite beautiful. I tried to get close to one, but it was a little too mucky. So, um, some of the ferns that we saw right at the edge of the pond, uh, they're quite large. I think those are cinnamon ferns, but I'm still working on fern identification. So maybe in a, Next year, I'll have some of those down. Uh, one of the thing, one of the best ways to identify individual species of fern is by the spore pattern underneath, and we're not in the time of year that they're setting spores, so it's uh, pretty hard. Um, without, uh, I always learn best with a when I'm standing next to somebody. Um, so, I haven't been standing next to too many people who know their fern, so I'm trying to learn it by the buck. And then of course, another yellow pond lily. And it also has the name Spatterdock, which is uh, kind of fun to say. And again, I always like, um, I guess you couldn't use that in Scrabble because it'd be a proper noun, but <laughs> if you're me, you could fudge a little <laughs> and say, oh no, that means the uh, type of, type of uh, plant and see if you get challenged. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> so after you leave the pond, you turn uh, south. And uh, at this point, the path follows 
several uh, small moist gullies or little ravines. And in the spring, it's really wet. You're gonna get your feet wet. Water is flowing over even the path at places. It can be very spongy. Um, even now, after as wet as it's been, this is a big area of mud. And it's, it's mud, it's wet. And there are lots of good prints in there. This, uh, if you wanted to go across it and beat your way up, this is an old path that the Laphams cut called the Marsh Path, but it hasn't been maintained because it's very difficult to mow almost most of the time unless it's very dry. Also, the, uh, as I mentioned, there's a lot of ravines. It's like these little, um, the ores, of course, would be too strong a word, but little ravines right next to each other. So there'll be a backbone ridge that you can walk along, and on either side, there's these gullies where water is running. And uh, you might say on Black Island, you don't think there are stream beds in there, um, but there's quite a few that look like stream beds in this area, but they look um, ephemeral as if they, you know, they dry, seem tend to dry up in the summer, at least a little bit. But there's got to be a lot of groundwater nearby to keep this as moist as it is uh, after the summer uh, that we've had so far. So I'm uh, just gonna try to back out a little bit. Again, this is one of those huge uh, swamp made of bowls. Can't even begin to do it justice. But as you go along and you're focused downwards, I noticed this little um, purple plant. This is a plant called um, Prunella vulgaris. I've always known it as Prunella. I'm not one to know most of my plants by their genus name, but for whatever reason, I learned it as Prunella and it stuck. It's also known as Self Heal or Heal All. It is in the mint family. If you pick it, you will see that uh, its stem is square, not cylindrical. And uh, I'm not sure how close I can get. Yeah, you can sort of get the idea that the individual flowers this is just a little, it's packed with individual flowers. I have that sort of um, irregular flower shape. In other words, it's not, um, um, it's not rays of petals, it's irregular. Uh, they call it lobed. Um, and that's very typical of mint flowers. So prunella, lots of that. It's usually in better shape in the spring, but there's actually a little patch of it right here, which again indicates moist soil. Other moist soil loving things would be sedges. And as along this path, I did come across some, uh, it's called sallow sedge. Sedges are, uh, well, they used to say sedges are wedges, right? So um, mints have square stems and sedges have triangular stems. I'm not going to be able to really see it, but they also have a, a form that you're that immediately says that's not a typical grass. It's not a grass. It's a sedge. This is the flower head, um, and it has these sort of extra little leaves that come off. I wonder if I had took enough of the picture. I think this. What's very interesting is that uh, there are male and female parts to this uh, to the flower heads of the sedge. These are the female parts, and these each one of these individual spikes will be the seed. Um, you're just seeing the spike end; you're not seeing the base end. And this spike, this brownish spike, has very tiny scales on it that are really this is the male part of the plant. So it will produce the um, the pollen that will pollinate the female part of the uh, of the sedge, and then these individual seeds will will um, ripen, fall off, and self seed in the area. So, and most sedges that you see will have this form of a straight stem and some little odd looking sort of cluster of it almost looks like a burr, um, and then uh, very narrow leaves of grass going or of leaves going off of it. So lots of it. If you look closely, there's flower head here and here and several down here and over here. So this is a nice little area of this uh, sallow sedge. Um, this is not the best time of year for fungus. It's just not wet enough. Um, so pretty much all you can find in the way of fungus are some of these shell fungus, which are pretty brittle. Even these will, once the fall comes and uh, gets 
a little bit darker and a little bit more wet, these will um, come alive and new ones will grow out and they'll feel very pliable. These are very brittle, easy to break off. There are many, 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 many species of shell fungus that grow on the side of um, wood or um, mostly you see them on wood, trees, things like that. But um, they, some species will grow on the side of stone. Um, for the most part, what we see on Black Island are the shelf fungus that grow on uh, woody material or trees. So a little bit further up the path, you come to this giant, uh, you know, I, I've walked this path enough in different times of the year that you get to know them, right? So this, this is a particular swamp maple. I haven't named it, but I know this swamp maple when I see it. It's an old friend. And uh, in here, it's very muddy, sort of like the other muddy area. Again, we haven't had a lot of rain, and yet it stays moist and squishy, and you really wouldn't want to walk in there and then go in somebody's house. Um, <laughs> that would not be good. Um, but it's, uh, you sort of feel like you're in an ancient forest sometimes with all the moisture and green and these big giant limbs of swamp maples hanging over you. It's a little bit, you know, it does filter out quite a bit of sun at this time of year. So it can be a little cool, which is nice. Um, but here's what it looked like in the spring before the leaves started coming. And it's the same tree. Uh, no vegetation around, and of course that mucky, that muddy spot is all water, and it's running down this little ravine towards the pond that we've just come from. So I suppose I should name this, but I don't, it's just the swamp maple that lives there. And then you go along the path, you come to one of, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I think it's like having kids. You really don't have a favorite kid, but if I did, maybe it would be this swamp maple. I love this swamp maple because there it is completely surrounded by these wonderful ferns. Um, it's like an enchanted area. Um, I always thought this would be a great place to, um, to spend the afternoon reading. It's shady. It's enough open around it so there's a little breeze sort of trickling through. Um, oops, I jumped a little quicker but that's okay. Here's, I couldn't, couldn't go without having two pictures of this swamp maple in the, in the presentation. The path goes right, comes up, we've just come from here and we're going this way. Um, and again, these wonderful ferns. I think these are lady ferns but I'm not 100% sure. They are smaller and they have a completely different form than the ferns that we um, saw back by the pond and of course they're in a completely different habitat so, and they're lush and thick and uh, and beautiful and if I was looking for an orb I'd be looking somewhere in the crooks of one of these trees <laughs> but I'm not looking for an orb today and as you come past that uh, that little that grove where the uh, ferns and the and the big swamp maple, you come into an, another grove, and I call this heron. The reason I do that is because the lapums, uh, when they they map their own map of the of the clayhead trails, they named all the lots after birds. And this particular lot is named heron. So it's hard for me to know how to describe things. It's you know, it's the grove of trees right before you get to the swamp maple with the ferns. So I attempted to put a name on it. But there's a nice little grove, open grove of trees, and it's large trees, uh, oak trees, chestnut, shad, cherry. Um, there's even, yeah, I said it, chestnut. So um, there's the, the large, which this large and this, this large are the same ones looking at different angles. Um, but this one gives a little bit better sense of the shadiness of the area. Um, and so, and then you also see in there. So one of the things I I love to notice the reason I focus on the trees in this area is how because the form of the trunks of these four plants, um, you could name the tree without looking at the leaves or the or the needles. This is a the largest at the little. It's a it's a deciduous evergreen. In other words, I mean it's a deciduous uh, conifer. It's a a, a it produces cones 
like a conifer, but it drops its needles like a like a deciduous tree. So uh, larch or tamarack um, is well known on the island. And that looks one way. They usually have at least a double trunk. Um, and then oaks are very straight, usually one trunk, and their their branches tend to come off more or less very horizontally, uh, almost perpendicular to the uh, to the tree. So that gives a form that you recognize right away as some type of oak. Shad um, has a smooth bark with these big blotches of gray lichens, where the choke cherry has a very rough um, bark. And it does have um, uh, lichens, but they're green lichens. Almost, you never see the smooth gray lichens on the uh, choke cherry, or vice versa. So lots of those. And of course, there's lots of other things in here. If you, we, if you don't just look up, you can look down and find something really interesting once in a while. This is a, a plant called Indian pipe. It's a very small. Um, it's, as far as I know, nobody had seen it on Block Island until last year. So I went back to check on it this year and it is just starting. Indian pipe is, is a regular vascular plant. It's, it has seeds um, and it produces uh, seeds and it spreads, but it's very white, so it does not photosynthesize. Uh, some people, uh, at one point, they thought it might be a fungus, but it's not. But it has a very interesting life cycle. It actually lives off of the nutrients from mycelium, which is the root rootlets root system of fungus so it lives off the mycelium of a fungus which is living in symbiotic relationship to a tree so the uh, fungus produces expands the amount of area where nutrients and water can be gotten for the tree so it basically it takes the root system of the tree and then expands it by adding this sort of network of uh, mycelium which is the fibers of a fungus uh, the tree produces um, sugars that it gets from photosynthesis to the fungus and the fungus gives the tree um, the water and the nutrients it's a symbiotic relationship uh, fungi, funguses uh, can be a problem, certain species on a tree. When you have a symbiotic relationship like this, both are benefiting and it is not harming the tree. And this is a fungus that is living in association with the tree underground in, its, among, in and among its root system. So then the Indian pipe comes and it puts its roots into the mycelium. So it is basically stealing uh, the uh, nutrients and the water and the sugars from the mycelium of the fungus. So this is considered a parasite because it doesn't provide anything good for the mycelium. It takes everything from the mycelium. But it's really beautiful. I, until last year, I had only ever seen this in um, uh, Washington state. It's a plant that likes woodlands, dark woodlands, forests, very rich, soils, moist soils. And for most of Black Island's history, at least since colonial times, Black Island has not been forested. It's been more, it was forested, then it was deforested. It was open uh, land with no rich, moist uh, soils that are darkened by tree life. So um, it's not surprising that it hasn't been known on Black Island. I have done uh, a little research on uh, the botanical records in Rhode Island and which there are some for Black Island and as no, this has not ever been described for Black Island until last year. And um, I p poked around a little bit and found some other patches of it this year. So it looks like it might be uh, a little bit stable in this area. It's going to be fun to watch over the years. And I cannot uh, take credit for finding this. My uh, my nephew, Sam Spear, called me up one day. He calls me with botanical or anything he finds that is natural history related that he thinks is interesting or he wants to know about. And he'll send me a text that says, Kim, what is this? 
And I looked at it and said, where are you? Because you're obviously not on Block Island because that's Indian pipe and we don't have that. Oh no, I am. <laughs> so obviously uh, that was fun. Uh, fun for me to find from a botanical natural history point of view and fun for me to have that interaction with my nephew. So that's Indian pipe. I hesitated to tell anybody where it was, but there it is out there in the open. Uh, so from that little grove of trees, we're going to move down the path. Uh, we're still moving more or less southward. We're going to go down this path, and there's a in it will intersect a path right here that's going in both directions. Um, and this path used to be the main uh, bluff trail before they made the trail from Long Lot. This was the main one. It's called the. It was then. I still call it sometimes the Blue Trail, but you go down and intersect the blue trail or the bluff trail. Oh, I forgot to put the number in there. Well, this was seven. <laughs> and we're going to, down to, or 11, I guess it was 11. We're going down to 12. This is 12 down here. So when you get down to this point, if you look right, you're looking here into what is called the Catbird Grove. It's really called, this lot is called the Catbird Seat. Um, and you go into this grove and, um, you might recognize this one as we get to it. It also has several different types of trees. It's got a fir tree, locust tree, lots of uh, rhodod several rhododendron, I should say, a couple of black cherries. Um, and this is the little grove that you see right when you enter off of the road that goes to Lapham's. And um, so there's, this is what the entry looks like. You just start down their dirt road. There's a, a, before you even get here, there's a sign that says welcome. When you get here, there's, this says, I think it says to the bluffs or trail to the bluffs. This sign right here says walkers welcome um, and some other, other uh, you know, warnings. Um, but it's a very welcoming, and I, I guess I'd like to just take this point to say, boy, the Laphams have done a wonderful thing by making all of these paths open and welcoming walkers of all types and, and uh, over a lot of land. So, and all their signs say, walkers welcome. But you can leave the bikes and the horses and the cars behind. All right, at this point, we're going to turn around and go back just a little bit. I just wanted to come out and show you how to enter from this point and we'll go so when we came down that hill just a few moments ago if we looked right we saw the grove if we had gone left we would have seen this uh boardwalk trail all right so until we got to this point we were going right now to head back we're going left so we took a left onto this trail and right when you get up here it opens up into another little grove and uh, it's just a, sh a short little grove. You, it is mowed. You can walk back in here and then walk out same way. And it's got oak trees, which you can tell by its form. It's got in the back, it's got a couple of rhododendron. Um, it's sort of a surprise in the spring when everything is still brown and gray and sticky looking uh, to walk back and see these giant rhododendrons um, that are uh, made it well established before the deer came to Block Island. So they, the, some of the rhododendrons in the Clayhead Trail system are huge. And there's a couple of big ones back in there. Uh, there's also chestnuts in here, um, as well as the oak and the rhododendrons. So you do a little diversion back there. Again, this is a nice picnic spot actually. And it's not too far from the entry that I just pointed out. So if you didn't want to go too far, you had a bunch of, a bunch of kids or one little kid, this would be a great afternoon picnic spot, either to come here or go up to the uh, to the maple with the um, with the ferns. You know, just completely different. If you've had enough sand and sea, go inland. Um, as you come along, eventually, and it's not too far, we're just doing a big U-turn, um, you'll come to a tree that is known, at least by those of us who hang around the, the Clayhead Trails a lot, as the Big Pine. This is a landmark. Um, There's a very big pine. Um, 
right here, it goes up like that. And the path comes down and goes left right around it. So when you get here, you're gonna go left around it and you're gonna take your first left. Um, <clears throat> if you were to go right at this point, you would end up in my bird banding nets and I probably wouldn't be happy. We usually put a sign up there, banding season that says, uh, you know, banding in progress or something. So, but this is the big pine, a uh, little hard to see, a little easier to see in the spring. Here it was before all the vegetation um, came on. Uh, you get a little bit better look at its form. Again, uh, this is a uh, pitch pine and there are not too many pitch pines on Block Island. And, uh, and you can see this pine from many places, especially in the winter when the leaves are off, <laughs> many places throughout the uh, Clayhead Trails. I've got to have a sip of coffee here. <clears throat> so it, no matter where you are, if you, in many places, you can see this giant crown of the pitch pine and sort of get your bearings. Oh, okay, well, if that's there, then I must be north or I must be east. So always look for the, for the big pine. <clears throat> now you will have gone left and left again and gone along a trail. <coughs> and the trail in both side, both up in all of this loop, except for the ends, like the end where by the big pine and the, and the catbird seat and the end by the uh, long lot, is very hilly, uh, not steep hills, but many hills. And they're steep. I mean, they're, they're short and steep. Um, and it's, it's, it's just an amazing, uh, if you, if you took all the vegetation off and looked at what the topography looks like, it's an amazing geology story. It's got to be, um, a mixture of maybe kettle holes, but mostly I think, uh, runoff, uh, channels because they're all very long and they're all very, uh, they have steep banks. Um, they're elongated in form. So as we go around, to get to this point, you would have gone up and down, up and down a couple of times. But again, not, you know, maybe 20 feet total. It's not a long climb or anything like that. And then you come down into this hollow. I could not get a photo that gave the sort of the depth of this hollow uh, justice. Um, and what's in here is a giant, this is a very big oak, and this is a very big rhododendron, and they are definitely competing for the same airspace. Um, and, but it's, again, you're walking around in the spring, you come on this, and you can't believe this, this giant spray of color. Um, you know, nothing has, has leafed out at that point. Um, and there's a couple of rocks set up here. I think there used to be a stone wall in this area. This, the soil is very spare. It's all leaves and needles and, and because it's so shaded that uh, there's really no light getting in there. Um, it is an area that could use a little TLC and remove the dead wood kind of thing. And uh, a big limb of the oak is kind of crushing down on top of the rhododendron. So, um, I guess we had enough of that. We'll move on. <laughs> so let's see, maybe, maybe my third favorite swamp maple. Uh, this is a big spreading swamp maple, maybe 50 feet from uh, where I was just showing you the oaks in the uh, rhododendron. Uh, and I think that th this, was, uh, this was taken last Saturday. It was a little cloudy, but not too cloudy. It definitely gives a sense of, uh, you know, the lack of light under the canopy in this area, in this whole walk, actually. Um, but I don't know, something very evocative about this particular uh, swamp maple. And so we've actually we went down to the roadies and now we've come up to the swamp maple. And now we're going to go down into the path that leads to spot number seven. So long lot pond path came out. We came out this way and went to the right. Now we're coming down and going back down uh, along the edge, the northern edge of long lot pond, and then we'll retrace our steps out to uh, Corneck Road. And, and this is 
looking at the path which I showed earlier coming this way. Now I'm showing it going that way. Kind of looks the same. Funny how that is. And hopefully while you were on this trail, if it was this time of year, you would have, since you were focusing down and not at the great sweeping vistas, vistas, hopefully you would have gotten yourself a handful of blackberries uh, to keep you going along the way because they are definitely coming out this week, next week, should be good blackberry time. So we, I did see a few, of the, I saw this one a goldenrod and this one apple tree full of apples. So they say this is preview of coming August beauties because we're going to be a wash in goldenrod in another three weeks. And uh, so far it looks like maybe we'll have a halfway decent apple year. Those were pretty, uh, pretty lush there. Uh, some early August sightings other than on this walk I've seen, the Beauty and the Beast. We've got this beautiful, this is uh, blooming around the island, sweet pepper bush. This is a, a freshwater uh, wetland obligate. In other words, it needs to grow in freshwater or, or at the edge of freshwater, so swampy edges. But it also likes sun. So a good place to see this is this one that's taken on Pilot Hill Road near uh, John E's Tug Hole. Um, and any uh, open, more open uh, wetland uh, pond, um, open water, you'll start to see sweet pepper bush in various stages of um, blooming right now. And it has a beautiful, sweet smell. It's beautiful at a little bit. If you take too much of it, it might be a little overwhelming. But sweet pepper bush, beautiful plant blooming right now on Black Island. Something else you might see is the beast. Uh, if you're in your garden at all, tomato hornworm is making itself known. This is gonna be a hawk moth, but right now it's destroying, it's, it's as good at destroying tomato plants as the uh, milkweed tussock moth caterpillar is at, at destroying uh, milkweed. So keep an eye out. They're kind of cool looking. They look like, I think they look sort of cute, actually. I like the way their feet are clasping that stem of the tomato plant. I'm sure the gardener wasn't happy. Also, other cool things seen this week. Um, song sparrow uh, nest was discovered almost out in the open uh, on the pavilion property with uh, a few eggs. I doubt this is gonna be a viable nest, but song sparrows will lay up to three nests in a season. Um, so I have not seen the bird, but I'm sure at first sight of humans, it's scattering. Unfortunately, it's in a place that sees a lot of humans. So I wouldn't be surprised to learn that this is an abandoned nest, but uh, beautiful in its own way. And uh, this is a, next to it is a grove snail. And this is a garden snail that's been introduced to the island, probably came in on planting materials <clears throat> over the last hmm, probably five years. Until last year, I would have said there are no land snails on Black Island, but I would have been wrong. The grove snail is definitely making an appearance. And this is a pretty large one. This one uh, was found by Isabel Dupont at the farmer's market. She was collecting um, compost for the Black Island Conservancy, and in somebody's uh, hunk of compost, there was the grove snail, which she rescued. And this photo, uh, I turned it to make it a little bit more visually pleasing. It's actually drinking condensation water from her cup of iced coffee. And it's, this, it's actually uh, 90 degrees turned upright. It is, it is vertical. So the coffee you can see is the cup. So, but it's actually what a beautiful animal. You know, again, not something you really want in your garden, but hey, whatever. And uh, my checklist for this walk. Um, I think the most interesting thing I heard on the and saw on this walk that I haven't seen in others is um, the downy woodpecker. So, uh, but. It's a mini checklist of things that I happen to see that day. Other things, of course, are um, possible. Oh, and the black crowned night heron, which was in that pond, in Longlot Pond. Um, and 
that's in the winter, in the fall, spring and fall, as soon as the black crowned night herons get here in the spring, they love that pond. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a nest somewhere in there. So <clears throat> with that, I'll happily take questions. And I think I'll go back to my <clears throat> Hello? I think you're muted, Charlotte. Yep, I am. I'm sorry. It's okay. I think I've been muted, everybody. I've been clicking too many times. <laughs> <laughs> but that was great, Kim. I love these trees. Yeah. Is, is the grove snail of concern? Um, not that I know of yet. <laughs> uh, last year, uh, one was found uh, at a very unlikely place where they were doing their revetment work at the transfer station on the ocean. I'm sure that one came in with all the fill material mm, that they brought. Okay. Um, so I don't know where, what part of the island this one came from. Before that, um mostly it had been seen by people living in the area of sands pond so again okay. most like garden related mm -hmm. okay um, i was wondering um thinking back to my youth when uh <clears throat> there were no trees at all basically uh, when do these swamp maples begin to grow uh interesting about the maple first of all of course it has a winged fruit so uh it's not hard for the seed stock to get here from the mainland in the way that it would be hard to get an acorn for instance uh but there's been some work done on the tree history of black island and many of the swamp maples or the big maples are growing in a place that wouldn't have been farmed um on a regular basis so that they wouldn't have been hayed or eaten by things or dug up by plowing. Uh, so they're usually in places that, that are wet that you wouldn't have been farming or they're right, they're associated, they're almost now part of a stone wall where again, uh, plowing and haying uh, would not have gotten the young ones. So they're probably at least starting many of these are probably prior to 1940 farming seemed to let off from the 40s and 50s so anything that was here would have kept going and many of these probably got their start even before that so wow mm -hmm. but if you go through the clayhead trails you find many places of swamp maples and I, I say swamp maple because I'm referring to the form and for the most part, they have a relatively small maple shaped leaf, but it's the swamp maple is just uh, a type of red maple. It's the same Acer rubrus or rubrus Acer uh, for, for the red maple, which is the state tree of, the, of uh, Rhode Island. So it's a, the red maple slash swamp maple complexes is, is uh, pretty much uh, native in, uh, in Rhode Island. When you, go, when you go on the regular Clayhead Trail and you break out in that, into that field, um, sort of high up before you start, that, that. Well, I don't know, try that again. Um, there's a, the field of sort of the top, the highest point of um, the regular Clayhead Trail and there's that giant tree there. Is that a swamp maple? I'm just. Uh, I think I'm sort of confused about where you are, but um, if you, it's at the highest point of the Clayhead Trail, which I think is more northerly. Never mind. Okay, sorry. <laughs> it's up at that field that when Morgan was Scott Cummings. Nature Conservancy vol junior volunteer. They had an enclosed area in that up field and they counted the plants. It was, you know, enclosed by wire and they counted the, but that deer couldn't oh. get it. 
Oh, yeah. It's, this has been a lovely, lovely. I want to go now. It's almost <laughs> after the summer is gone. Yeah, it'll be it'll be beautiful. Okay, great. Any other questions? Well, or comments? No. Okay, well, if anybody ever has questions or comments they want to make offline, I'm at kim.gaffet tnc at tnc.org. Feel free to email me if you have anything you want to follow up with. I have another question. May I ask it? Yeah. Yes, the pepper bush. That's not buckthorn either, though, right? Sorry, pepper bush? Pepper bush. Shoot the pepper bush. And it reminds me of the invasive buckthorn that I battle all the time. No, it's definitely not. No, it's definitely not. It's actually, I uh, uh, can't remember, it's, I think it's Clethra, but I'm not sure about it, its genus name, but it's definitely not Buckthorn. It's a beautiful um, native sweet pepper bush. Okay. All right, Kim, so we'll see you at Clayhead again next week, huh? Yep, and we'll be doing a sort of mid-eastern and we'll be focusing a, a lot more on the uh, ponds of clayhead so. okay all right all right everybody great well thanks okay. everyone thank you thank you Beautiful. thank you okay bye-bye bye-bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye.